Good day, everyone. We are back again for another part of our beginner series. We're already on class five. So after today, we have just two, three more. Yeah, because we have eight in total. So six, seven, eight is all we will have left after today. And today will be a little bit more of going into what is yoga right like what is it we've been doing different stretches and breathing techniques we've learned how to use props to help our breathing and now it's time to discuss what yoga is so of course or perhaps well let's just let, let's just dive right in okay so yoga is all about relationships so that's your relationship with yourself, the relationship you have with other people, because of course our relationship to ourselves is directly reflected in our relationships with other people and the world around us. So this really makes yoga the journey or a path of connection. So again, that's internal connection to self and external connection with the world around you. So the Sanskrit root from which the word yoga is derived is yuj, Y-U-J, which means to yoke or to connect. So many people, of course, think of yoga as either a system of physical exercise um, or a means of calming the nerves, uh, even sometimes escapism from the chaotic world that we live in. And yoga can be any of these, but it's also so much more. And I know that if you take my classes regularly, you already know this <laughs> because we dive in so much deeper than what's happening just on a physical level. So I personally, of course, see yoga as a journey and a method of exploring the internal world and the external world. So a method of exploring our physiology, a method of exploring our psychology and our behavior, and a method of exploring our spiritual self or our true authentic self and nature that resides deep within the heart and even beyond the heart. So it's really a method of self-exploration, which also allows us to more readily explore the world around us. So it's exploring the body, the mind, and of course, realizing our eternal connection with that vast untapped potential or even the unified field as it's commonly known this day and age. So yoga, both on and off the mat, offers every single one of us a sort of uh, metaphorical ladder. So uh, a possibility to figuratively climb our way toward jiva mukti or liberation. So jiva mukti is another Sanskrit term, which again, it just simply translates to liberation. And as we climb this ladder, as we move through the rungs of this ladder, we take on the yoga viewpoint and ascend out of the world of stress and worry and limitation. Yeah. And we end up being able to see beyond ourselves and develop a relationship with our higher, more centered self or soul or authentic being, whatever label you would like to give it. So of course, yoga works with the raw material common to each one of us, no matter where or how we live our lives. So that's our body, our breath, our mind, and our emotions. So you could think of these, this raw material, I should say, as kind of like little pebbles that you pick up from the beach, which you can take home and you can polish until eventually they become precious stones. So there are no real gadgets in which, to, in which to refine the stones into perfection, but yoga allows or encourages us to use what we've got, right? To be where we are here and now, and to take the time to look inside ourselves and find 
potentially new ways of reconnecting with who we really are. So being able to peel back the layers of the onion or uncover our unpolished but beautiful inner stones or gemstones, which often, of course, we lose, lose sight of because, well, the world we live in is so fast paced and extremely achievement driven. Yeah, so it can be really easy to lose sight of ourselves in the process. Um, yeah, so keeping that in mind that yoga is so much more than the physical exercise. And if you're in a state where you think that yoga is very simply just exercise, then you haven't done enough yoga. And perhaps you need to dive in a little bit deeper and consider what's being said in classes a little bit more deeply because especially if you're practicing with me we talk about psychotherapy behavioral patterns emotions all of that sort of stuff throughout each and every class so considering all of the ways that yoga allows you to open into a deeper journey of you yeah so the next time life feels full of mental stress and physical tension, very simply, choose yoga. It can help you to find ways to ride the waves and even transcend those waves or sorrows or stresses or whatever they may be. Having a regular spiritual, mental and physical yoga practice can empower and ground you helping you bring stress under control and cultivate balance and life purpose in its broadest sense. Yeah, it helps us to step back and see things as they are rather than how we are. So we stop projecting so much on the outside world and instead we're able to step back without attachment and simply observe. It's a whole different ball game of perception, really. So what else do we want to go through today? Hmm. Yoga in general, of course, is a very broad topic, right? Because we cover philosophy, we cover physical practice, we cover spiritual tools and techniques, we discover uh, psychotherapeutic tools and techniques. So we're really working through all of those beautiful facets of our human experience but in order to do that, we need to actually do the practice, right? So simply saying, oh yeah, I meditate, but never doing it. Well, meditation is not going to work for you if you don't do it, right? And recognizing too, just while I'm talking about meditation, is that's like the beginning of your yoga practice. If we were to re rewind a few hundred years or a few thousand years even, it would be required of you to demonstrate your already known integration of the basics of yoga, which we are going to continue going over in this uh, class today. But keep that in mind. Here in the West, it's really ac accessible to get to a yoga class. People don't ask you if you have um, the eight limbs of yoga memorized and practiced. Right, And some of you watching this probably don't even realize that there are eight limbs to the yoga practice because your only exposure has been asana or the physical postures. Now, if you're this far along in our beginner series, you already know that meditation and breath work are the foundation of a yoga practice. But again, in the Western world, that is not what is shown to us. So most people are walking around with the programming in their mind thinking yoga is just a bunch, a bunch of physical exercise. And if the mind is in that state, you are doing yourself a great disservice to an extremely broad practice, which can really help through many areas of life. Um, and also remember too that in the West, because we focus so much on the asana, it kind of strips away the other yoga concepts like mantras and pranayama, which is breath. Mantras are like voice, singing, toning, uh, words that we say over and over again, self-affirmations. And it also takes away from the esoteric 
pedestals on which the practice sits, right? Um, which can make the practice seem unaccessible when we just think that it's asana related, but really, if we think about it more openly, it makes the practice incredibly accessible because we can enter into the practice in any way which we need to at the time. Uh, so, of course, breath work, meditation, like all of these things can be completely accessible for beginners. You can start to practice whenever you want to, or even when you don't want to. That's usually the better time to start. <laughs> The yogic path offers us the opportunity to see that the proverbial heaven, if you will, actually lies within us. It lies within our perception of ourselves and then is reflected out into our reflection of the world. So it offers a wonderful opportunity to get a different look at life in general. Yeah. So let's consider... Um, the origins of yoga. So of course it's useful to know a little bit about the roots of yoga before setting out on your own yoga journey. And we have already gone pretty deep into some basic breath work and postures to begin your journey, but we want to go a little bit deeper in like, why are we doing this practice and where did it even come from? So we have really no way of knowing for sure how long people have been practicing the yogic way of life, but it's believed that this wisdom was passed down orally from guru to disciple during ancient India's Vedic age as a means of living a harmonious and spiritually connected life. The word Vedic derived from the Sanskrit Sanskrit, Sanskrit root vid, meaning knowledge, and the writings of this age known as the Vedas, which consists of four books, and they convey key Hindu teachings, and they contain the earliest known written records of yoga. Other yogic texts followed throughout the, uh, sorry, other yogic texts followed throughout the ages and inspirational uh, quotes and all of that such, I'm sure you see it all the time, right? And we'll go over a few of the, the basic origin or basic types of yoga or texts of yoga that have been passed down. So of course, yoga is now practiced widely across the globe, but it was only in the 1960s that it first captured the intent attention and imagination of people in the West. So due to, to an influx of Indian teachers. Since then, it has grown enormously in popularity. Uh, and a key figure in this growth being Swami Sir Sivananda, who established the five pillars of yoga practice. So let's first go over some key yoga texts and then we'll go over the five pillars. So key yogic texts, a few of them anyway. So first we have the Upanishads and these were originally transmitted orally and this follow on to the four main Vedic texts is thought to have first been written down around 800 BCE. So it describes an ancient way of living appropriate to a higher caste Hindu men and renunciates based mainly on study, contemplation, and meditation. So of course, now this text is a main inspiration to anyone interested in pursuing a yogic way of life. So that's the Upanishads. Second up is the Yoga Sutras. So in Sanskrit, the word sutra means thread. In this case, a string of 185 aphorisms or wisdoms about the yogic lifestyle. These are teachings of the most recognized sage of Hatha Yoga, Patanjali, who is thought to have lived in the second or third century CE. Although written some 2000 years ago, this text sets out to the eight limbed path of yoga that many still observe today. And we will get to that in a moment. The sutras are, oh, they're so wonderful, and we go pretty deep into the study of those in our yoga school as well. 
But the Bhagavad Gita, we definitely study this book in yoga school. I highly recommend this as a reading just in general for anybody that wants to start a yoga practice. So forming the kernel at the heart of this epic Indian story, the Mahabharata, the Gita is thought to have been written around 400 to 300 BCE by anonymous sages. It describes a symbolic spiritual battle as its narrator, Lord Krishna, explains the warrior to the warrior Arjuna, valuable tenets of yoga philosophy to follow, mainly the ways of wisdom, jnana, devotion, bhakti, and selfless action, karma. And then we have the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is written by sage Swamarata Yogin Yogendra in the mid 14th century. And this is considered to be the earliest written instruction manual purely on Hatha yoga. And it remains the primary text on the subject today with descriptions of postures, which are asanas, breathing practices, pranayama, gestures, which are mudras, yeah, cleansing techniques, which are kriyas, and energy locks, bandhas, all of those, well, not all of them, but we get more into mudras, kriyas, and bandhas in yoga school. You will see little bits of that throughout the main offerings in the My Yoga Tribe section, but if you want to go deeper, it's really all about going into yoga school. So let's tap in a little bit here. So before we go into the five pillars, let's talk about uh, four main yoga paths explained. So Hatha Yoga, which is what most of you will know, this path forms, excuse me, part of the Raja Yoga or the Royal Path or Path of Kings which employs meditation practices as a way of freeing the mind and attaining liberation. Hatha Yoga follows the eight-limbed system recommended by Sage Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, which include alongside psychophysical exercises, cleansing practices, and meditation. Hatha Yoga's main instrument is the body, which may be why this form of yoga has such a great appeal to people in the West and who are in search of enhanced health and well-being. Dhyana yoga is the, or sorry, the aim of this yogic path is to achieve connection with the transcendent self through study of yoga philosophy. So the Sanskrit word dhyana means knowledge, especially spiritual knowledge. And the main tools of this path are self-study and inquiry. Dhyana yoga tends to have a particular appeal to people drawn to intellectual pursuits. Karma yoga, the aim of this yogic path is to find connection with the divine through selfless service to others. The Sanskrit word karma means action or work. So if you consider uh, Gandhi as a person that could be an example of embodiment on this path, uh, which certainly tends to appeal to people who are drawn to more charitable pursuits. And then we have bhakti yoga, and this yogic path involves connecting with a mystical otherness through worship, ritual, and song, all of which can touch the heart. The Sanskrit word bhakti means devotion or worship. This approach often appeals to people drawn to ritual and ceremony. So considering that, yeah. And then we have, I wanted to go through the five main paths as well. Um, sorry, Facebook's giving me a little message here that my internet is slow and I want to make sure the video doesn't cut off. Okay. Okay, we're here. <laughs> uh, and it closed my other <laughs> program. That's all right. I can read from here. So we have our five pillars of yogic balance. So that's in, this is from the Sivananda school. And uh, so we have 
right exercise. So this means regularly practicing asanas and other forms of exercise as well with good intention and according to your age, your state of, set of health and the needs of your body. So that means figuring out a practice no matter what, right? So that means if there's an injury you're dealing with, you can still practice. It might look like meditation. It might look like breath work. It might look like restorative, right? It could look like so many things, but the point is that you're practicing right breathing this involves of course working toward awareness of the breath at all times and re-establishing deep natural breath just like a child does but we want to be able to tap into that all the time and that breath energizes our body and our entire being and the third pillar is right thinking so this entails decluttering your mind toward a um of all the scattered thoughts, right? So being able to focus in, let all the other stuff shed aside so that you can find a sense of clarity and calm and cultivate a positive attitude. Because the only reason we don't have a positive attitude is because we don't have knowledge or awareness of any other possibility. Just like the same thing that happens if we get aggressive. People only really get aggress aggressive when they have no other solution, right? So considering these things, and this is the gift of yoga, being able to step back, recognize what's happening without attachment, and then move forward with action. And then we have right nutrition. So this means being aware of what you feed yourself. So this is your body, and I would also include the mind with that. But of course, if we're speaking about the body, we want to generally feed ourselves and nourish ourselves with fresh, seasonable, seasonal, uh, nutritious food in moderation and eating that food slowly and mindfully. And then right relaxation. Hmm, this is something often people forget to do is relax. So this entails taking time to balance all the activity in your life. We all do so much, right? So giving yourself adequate rest and also mental relaxation as well as physical. So we need to have the components to relax all of those states. So we want our emotional self to be able to relax. We want our spiritual self to be able to relax. And of course, our physical body, we want that to be able to relax too. So those are the basic five pillars of growth or of practice in yoga. And I'm gonna pull up my next little bit here. I have a few notes just so I don't forget to cover uh, anything. All right. Oh, I lost my screen again. <laughs> uh, thanks for sticking with me. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, we've gone through so much already, but let's go into the, I think we are ready to go into the eight limbs. Uh, yeah, we've already talked about all that other stuff. So it's time to tap into the eight limbs. We have just a few minutes left to blast through this. So the eight limbed path. A little song that I like to teach all of my yoga school students is on the eight limbed or the eight limbs of yoga. Yama niyama sana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhyam. Okay, so those are our eight limbs. So let's dive into the yamas and niyamas first. And keep in mind, these are practices that would be a requirement in order for you to be accepted into any yoga practice. So being able to simply step into a yoga class here in the West is an extreme privilege to be able to tap into this really ancient wisdom. Okay, so Yama. This is the first limb, and this recommends the five ethical practices or restraints. 
and uh, they start with ahimsa. So this is applying non-violence to every part of your life, not harming others or yourself. By the way, we go over these in even more detail in yoga school. So if you find as we're going through this stuff that you start to get really inspired by the philosophies and just the few things that we touch on here, yoga school might be a really awesome option for you. And no, you do not need to want to teach yoga in the end. You can, if that's your desire, then 100% you need to dive in. But yoga school is used to up your own personal practice and be able to really get serious in your practice of yoga way beyond what is offered in just a typical class, okay? So the second part of the yama, so the yamas, there are five elements here. So we just went through ahimsa, so non-violence, non-harming, satya, which is truth or living according to your own truth. So we want to be embodied in our own satya or truthfulness, right? And this is often quite challenging for many people because what is accepted in our culture is conformity. Uniqueness is not really embraced, even though we may be told, be yourself, be authentic. As soon as we are ourselves or are authentic, generally speaking, we get pushed down by others that are perhaps disturbed from that step away from the norm. So this requires a real aspect of inner strength to simply be you according to your truth, not what is prescribed from the outside world. This is a deep-seated knowing that comes from within. Uh, Asteya, which is non-stealing, straightforward enough. Now, often though, most of the time people will think that non-stealing just has to do with not stealing material items. But this also means not stealing people's energy, not stealing people's time, right? So not aiming to get everything for free, so to speak. How often do you reach out to others and ask to quote unquote, pick their brain. What happens in this? It sure may seem innocent enough, but you're actually robbing the person of all of the time and energy that they have put into that practice that you are personally demonstrating that you do not value because you're asking for information or advice for free. So this is something to be really aware of right? Because that's when we get stuck in our own personal value systems and things can get a little bit crossed in the paths. So if we're valuing something or devaluing something, we want to be sure that we're not trying to take from others, right? We're honoring ourselves fully from the inside out and that reflects to other people. So when it comes to that non-stealing, if you're not authentic in your own truth, if you haven't accessed your own truth, if you haven't practiced being your own truth, then you're naturally going to start stealing truth from others. Let's move on. Brahmacharya, this is the fourth, and this is abstinence or containing sexual energy. Now this does not mean that you do not engage sexually. This does mean that when you do, it is meaningful. It is in your heart of hearts. It is in your line of truth. It's not superficial. It's not just for egoic desire or lust. Aparigrata, non-grasping, non... Basically, just being able to let go of your own desires. Now, we can still have you know, will, we can still have goals, but we're not so attached to them that it's the only thing we're fixated on, right? We can have a goal, but we can also still live our lives, yeah? And Niyama, so we're into the second limb now. So Niyama, the second limb prescribes five essential self-observances. So the first one is saucha, and this is cleanliness, internal and external. 
So of course, this comes back to what you're feeding yourself from a food point of view, what you're feeding yourself emotionally, what you're feeding yourself in your thoughts. Yeah, how you care for your body. Do you try to keep yourself clean? Do you shower every day? Basic things, right? Your home space, clean, tidy. Why? Because your inner space is clean and tidy and we want that reflection outwards. Our home, our body, yeah? These are reflections of how we feel on the inside. The body is the unconscious mind. So if there's stuff in our body that shows up and we don't seem to understand where that comes from, rest assured that there's some unconscious or subconscious stuff going on that could be revealed with some practice in yoga. Santosha or contentment. So this is an acceptance of what life brings you without needing to attach, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is blah, 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 blah. This is, it just is. Tapas, this is austerity or disciplined practice. Very simple, stay consistent, do it. Find your excuses. We can logic ourselves out of anything we want to. That doesn't mean that it's the thing we need to do. So stay committed to your practice and stay consistent regardless, again, of what life throws at you. Life will always give you a reason to excuse yourself from your practice and as a yogi as a person who practices yoga it's your responsibility to be responsible for you and that is not let the ego take the driver's seat the ego stays in the back seat so don't let the ego convince you that you don't need to do the inner work because we all do we all need to have these spaces of inner reflection Swadhyaya or self-study. This is the study of spiritual texts to promote more understanding. And Ishwara Praridhana is surrender to higher being. So that is knowing that there is something far larger, far greater than us and far larger and far greater than any of us will ever understand. So simply allow it to be. So again, being in your being. We have just a few more minutes here, so let's see if we can get through. Number three is asana. So the third limb refers to the physical yoga practices and poses that we all know so well. And really, what are these practices and postures for? These are to make sure that we can sit for long periods of time in meditation. The word asana translates into seat. Yeah? And many poses, in the beginning, most of the poses actually were all seated postures. So it hasn't been until really the last like hundred years that all these other more dynamic postures have come into the practice. And that is from the early 1900s influence of wrestling and gymnastics that's come into the yoga practice. So now with that, we've got just five more to go through in about three minutes and that will conclude our practice for today. So let's see if I can get through these and then we'll dive in a little deeper next week and explore some meditation practice as well. So number four, pranayama. This is our breath, the art of breathing well. Prana means breath, vitality, energy, life source, anything along those lines really and pranayama regulates and extends energy flow through the body and there are many breathing exercises to move through in the my yoga tribe alone there are loads of breathing practices i recommend starting slow and moving your way to more challenging ones the fifth limb is pratyahara and this means to reverse or draw in the mind and the senses away from the outside world to introduce calm. So this is very simply getting in the zone, getting in your flow state. And how does this happen? We connect with the breath. Yeah. And we get in to our space so that everything else starts to fall away. Number six, dharana, the sixth limb urges you to concentrate until your mind becomes focused on a still point. So this is a way that we can get 
into a deeper state of awareness, into a flow state. Uh, the Sanskrit root da means to support. And the final two limbs rest on this one. So the first five are like physical things we can do, things that we can focus our mind in and actually physically to do. And the sixth one is kind of getting there, but really six, seven, and eight, these are all spiritual practice aspects that happen only when you have practiced the first five. So you're not going to get into a state of dhyana, which is limb number seven, and this is the unbroken flow of consciousness toward one point of focus or meditation, the flow state, which we recently talked about in yoga school in the 100 hour program. So this limb is the fruit of dhyana. So occur this occurs to you as you focus on one point in a state of continuous calm, right? And the root of di means intellect or thinking. So we need to let go of the thinking mind and be in the space, be in the zone, yeah? And again, this isn't something that you can just say, oh cool, I'm in the zone now. Like this is a physiological thing that requires time and practice to get into. And samadhi, what we're all going for is observing the first seven limbs brings you into a balanced mind state where you are aware of the eternal and sama equal, uh, means equal or um, equal thinking. So sama equal and chi or di rather is thinking. So equal thinking. Yeah, we're not really thinking. We're being in the moment. Our attention is focused in, we're in the zone. And our cognition is still high, but we're not analyzing. The analytical mind is not participating in this. We are direct connection to the unified field, to source energy, whatever label you want to give it. So again, to just go through that briefly, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Yeah? The first five, these are physical practices that you do. The last three are things that happen to you once these first five are practiced and ingrained and embodied. Yeah? All right. Well, that just flew by, didn't it? I hope you learned a little bit more about, like, what is yoga? Yeah? And uh, next week we'll go even deeper into how to choose a practice that suits you, as well as a bunch of other things that uh, I'll surprise you with then. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed and much love everyone. See you again next time.